Okay, I guess uh, we will start. I will tell you a little bit about what we learned from or while building a distribution and especially while trying to make a distribution that is easily extensible. A little bit about me. I'm Oskar Bechtold. I work at Bright Solutions as a Drupal developer and now as a software architect. So I plan stuff after the customer tells us what he wants and I translate this into stuff that we developers understand. I also study computer science at Technical University of Darmstadt and I run my own little business where I have a, um, actually a Drupal commerce online shop where I import marmalade from Thailand and sell it online. In Drupal I've done pretty much everything you can do, front end, back end development, theming, site building. So I don't know, you, I guess you would call it a full stack Drupal developer. Um, and at the moment I'm mainly responsible for the architecture of Apple platform, the distribution that we are building. And that's why I'm also telling you a little bit about that. And I have given workshops and trainings and talked on Drupal camps and now I have, I can say I have talked on a DrupalCon and that's why I'm a little bit nervous and I'm looking forward to your feedback at the end. <laughs> okay, so first of all, um, I want to tell you what is our story about why did we actually build distributions. So in the beginning, we needed an intranet, a project management tool, a CRM tool, something to uh, organize the data that we work with in our company. So we built an intranet for ourselves with Drupal because we realized Drupal is uh, able to do that and um, yeah, we didn't find a solution that fit all our needs so we thought we build it ourselves and it does fit our needs. We then developed Airpal for service providers which was the new approach that we actually wanted to publish. So this was the first distribution that we built and it is a ERP system project management tool specially aimed at service providers like we have been at that time or we are. Then we, it, it's open source so we didn't sell the distribution but people came to us and asked us, hey can you customize this? I have a little bit different use case and uh, I want to give you some money so you can customize it. And of course we did that and we then realized that we didn't have this in mind. We had this one use case in mind to build a distribution for service providers, how we needed it. And we, did, we couldn't think of different use cases or we, we just didn't do it at that time. And so we uh, noticed that it's a little bit hard to customize it. And that's when we decided, okay, hey, let's build Apple platform. Let's build a distribution that has business use cases in mind, but it doesn't specifically focus on one use case, but it tries to be flexible and to be a base, a platform to build your uh, own business software on top of that in a way that you need it. And then it's even suitable for non-service providers, for example. And now we love customizing it because our main goal was to make a distribution that is extensible. That really was our main focus. For service providers, we had one use case in mind and focused on that. And with Apple Platform, we had all use cases in mind. Now we had none in mind and we tried to make it extensible so we could match all of them. So we actually realized that Apple for service providers is an end user ready solution. You can just download it, you install it, and it works right out of the box. And if you want to customize it, it's sometimes complicated because it was not desi designed that way. So Apple Platform, as I said, we focus on making it extensible and um, creating a foundation for site builders and developers that they can build their own uh, business platform on top of it. So today I want to tell you a little bit about the tools and the modules we've used. Um, 
about make files, distributions, uh, installation profiles, unlink uh, configurations, features, and all that stuff, because those are all modules that are um, recommended to use while developing a distribution, and some of them we found are mm, a good idea, but maybe don't work out that well. So first of all, who knows what a distribution is? Okay, who has used one? Okay, who has built one? Okay, there are a couple, so I'm interested in your opinion after. <laughs> so I, I, for this uh, um, talk, I tried to find out the real definition of a distribution, so I looked it up on uh, Drupal.org. Don't worry, it's blurred uh, on purpose, because I don't want you to read it, I want you to listen to me. <laughs> um, so on Drupal.org it says uh, distributions are uh, provide site features and functions for a specific type of site in a single download containing Drupal core modules, themes, configurations. That's how it's written on Drupal.org. When you look up installation profiles, it tells you it combines co uh, Drupal core, it con uh, contributed modules, themes, configurations into one download. And I'm like, wait, what? it says exactly the same, it's just different grammar, so it, can we consider it the same? And then I thought, well, I don't like having two words and then not differentiating between them, so I dug more into it. And what they both say, it's a single download, and they both say it's uh, Drupal core modules configuration, but there must be a difference. So I found on Drupal.org, complex profiles are sometimes called distros. And I'm like, what do you mean by complex? Where do you set the line? How, when do you call it complex? And uh, why would you then call it different? Um, so let's start with installation profiles. You've all seen them. By default, you have the uh, standard and minimum uh, installation profile. And to develop these, you have an info and a profile file. The profile file is like the module file for modules. These two are required. And then you can also add an uh, install file that can manipulate the installation process. And then there's make files. Make files can be seen as a recipe how to install a Drupal, which contribute modules uh, you want to download, which patches and stuff. So it's actually you write in one file a description what should be done, and Josh Make then can download everything that you require, kind of require in that file. Yeah, Josh uh, can create that Drupal site, downloading all the contrib modules, patches. And Drupal.org also does that. When we download a distribution, then it's actually uh, created with Josh Make. So I have a proposal for you. Let's agree on this. An installation profile is something you develop because you add modules, you have the um, configuration that you add, and the distribution is something you actually download because you would never download an installation profile by itself. So I think in this way it's, it's quite nice to talk about it. And so the installation profile is kind of the recipe when you cook something and it has all the instructions and all the ingredients. And when you download it or when you start to eat it, you have a fully cooked meal, so that's what your distribution is. So in general, you, when you develop a distribution, you usually develop uh, or work on make files. You work on the info and the install and the profile files for your installation profile. Okay, so some distributions that we have uh, used are Commons, OpenAtrium, Acquia, Drupal, Panoply, Airpal for service providers and Airpal platform, Commerce Kickstart, Async Drupal, but there's many more that I think are worth looking at. So what are some reasons why we should use distributions and why we should build one? Um, first of all, with Drupal distributions, you can evaluate the possibilities. You can uh, check out what Drupal is actually capable of doing. 
You can demo Drupal. If you just want to show, convince a customer, hey, we should use Drupal, look at what can be done with it. Um, but you can also learn a lot from it. You can learn lots about how to code, how to use hooks. Just look at what they do and you can learn a lot of this. But you can also use them as an out-of-the-box solution. So if you download Drupal core, there's not much you can do. You can, if you use the um, standard installation profile, you can have sites and articles, and that's about it. But if you want to have a, uh, if you want to have an application for service providers with project management and invoicing and stuff, maybe Apple for service provider is the right thing for you, or uh, the commons distribution when you want to uh, interact in groups and stuff. But it can also be uh, used to quickly build a site. So when you have a foundation that you want to, do you always have the same modules that you enable in the beginning of your uh, process when you work on a project? Um, then maybe a distribution is something good that brings all those modules so you don't have to manually download them and add them to your project. You could build one um, when you want to use, as I just said, the same setup, for example, multiple times and create the same site more than once, then you could uh, use a distribution. You could also uh, look into different use cases in different markets as we do with Apple. We showcase and we actually use it to uh, use Drupal in the business world to create business uh, applications with it. And of course, we can give that back to the community because we use lots of contrib modules and we profit from the community, but we know that the community may be interested in using that tool as well, so that's why we decided to create an open source um, distribution. Our main focus is on quickly building a site, so we mainly use it as a foundation to start a new site, and um, we mostly do that because we want to often build the same site. We focus on the business applications, and there's some principles that you can use in every uh, business application, that's why we decided a distribution is something good for that. So what have we used the distributions for in general? We have used async Drupal uh, to build dynamic interactive sites. So if you want to have lots of Ajax and stuff, maybe you can have a look at this. We have used Commerce Kickstart to build online shops, which is really nice. Most of the times we built the online shop with Commerce Kickstart, but we didn't use it on the live site. Um, I will tell you later a little bit more why we didn't do it that way. But we, for example, built our own features within Commerce Kickstart and then moved it to the actual site. We use Apple for, uh, Apple for service providers to uh, use the business application as a ready-made business application. Uh, we use Apple Platform to build business applications that don't have this specific service provider's use case. And we used Panoply because it brings a better user experience than Drupal core itself and brings lots of modules like panels and panels everywhere and CK editor, stuff that we use on, any, on every project anyway. So that's uh, a nice thing that they provide those modules that we use anyways. So when we develop a distribution, we need to differentiate between hard and soft configuration. Because we also introduced some logic with our distribution, um, and this may be not changed later on. But there's also some setup, uh, some settings that should be overridable and that the admin could change. Um, so, for example, the text system or something. We we don't want to override the text system itself, but maybe we need to set up the taxes themselves. So we would, with the distribution, um, provide the hard configuration of the text system or the product or line item system so we can actually uh, create invoices and uh, stuff like this. But maybe we want to provide a default text or an example text, but this needs to be overridable by the um, administrator or the developer that sets up the module. Um, I think this uh, shows what could happen when you uh, use a, when you change a hard um, configuration. 
For example, when we want to create invoices and we depend on the price field that comes with commerce, of course you can change the, the price field, but you will not be able to create the invoices. So you could really break the behavior of the site. Um, but there's other things like we use commons for the, um, for the project management and you decide, okay, commons is not the right module, I want to use the reply module because it's more flexible. Then you could do that because we don't, um, we didn't specify it as a hard configuration and we let you actually override it. So we, since, since we want Airpal platform to be customizable, we had to think about what options are there to customize um, a distribution and most of them are very similar to customizing uh, Drupal core. Whenever we build a site with Drupal core, we kind of customize it. So we have the alter hooks, we have pre-processing, we have custom modules, we have themes, sub-themes, um, but we also have uh, features and features overrides and stuff like this. That is actually recommended to use uh, when dis building a distribution and when customizing a distribution. And uh, that's what I want to talk about a little bit more now. So our experience in general with the existing distributions was that it's quite often hard to customize. If a distribution uses features, you can't use features to customize it. And overriding a feature is quite hard. But also updating can be very painful. I don't know who has used a distribution, updated it, and stuff broke. Mm -hmm. That's quite a few people. But we wanted to be Apple Platform to be customizable, and we thought, man, we are kind of crazy, but we accept the challenge, and we, we will make it customizable, and I think we have a very nice approach um, that I will tell you more about now and uh, the modules that we use for that. So in the beginning, there's features. Uh, the features is the tool to uh, capture configuration. And it actually says on Drupal.org that it's the tool to capture configuration for dis Drupal distributions. So what have we used it for? What can it be used for? First of all, we can store site config in file system, which we, who, who didn't use features? Okay, everybody then I can, I think, go quicker. But uh, the main idea is to control the changes in Git, to make configuration deployable, to revert changes, and to have a code-driven development. I just talked to somebody earlier who told me he would always copy the database. This is what you don't want to do. Oh, if you don't want to do it, you use the features. And when we develop a distribution, that's actually what we want. We want to deliver stuff in code. We don't want to deliver a database. So for example, the content types, the views, the rules, the stuff that we want to deliver with our distribution. So it sounds like it's actually uh, useful, but I asked my team after developing all those distributions, do you think features are suitable? And most of them said no. If you add these two numbers up, yes, it's more than 100% because some people said, y yeah, no, it depends on what you want to do. So that's. I was, when I tested this presentation, everybody told me this doesn't add up to 100%, so I'm, I know. <laughs> um, so I also asked my team, why do you think so? First of all, I think this is a problem that doesn't only apply to distribution, but to all other websites as well. Sometimes features are just overridden and you don't know why. Especially if you work in a team of multiple people, you pull uh, your git, and it's overridden and you revert and it's overridden and you revert again and you just don't know what happens. So this kind of makes the development process a little bit annoying. There's no such thing as a customizable features. Uh, who had it that the customer wanted some text that you deploy, but he can always change? Who had this situation? People always think you could do this with features, but once the the panel or whatever, uh, the content is changed on the live server, the feature is overridden, and the next time you deploy new changes, um, you revert the feature and everything is lost, so there's no really good way to have a customizable feature. The complexity of overriding a feature is 
quite high. There are modules for them that I will cover in a second. Uh, and we always had conflicts and over in features which just didn't sound too good. And, um, but some of the team said it's very nice to um, deploy example configuration. So for example, the soft configuration that I talked about, you just want to enable one type of text so the people can actually use your distribution and try it out without setting up everything. So that's why some people said yes, it's good for that. Um, for example, we used Panoply, and we really liked the idea that Panoply did, but we installed it and instantly we had conflicts and overridden features without even touching it. We just installed it. And this was really not, not so much fun to actually use a distribution as a base for your project when it's overridden before you even touch it. So, yeah, we didn't think that features is that, that good of an idea. I actually talked to Mike Parra, the um, maintainer of features, yesterday quite long. He unfortunately can't be here today. Um, he had some good points about them, but I still think that all those overrides and the complexity of overriding them makes it not that useful when developing the distribution. So then there's features overrides, and this has the sole purpose of building a new feature on top of existing ones. So the idea is you have a distribution that um, is built with features and you want to customize it and you want to store your customizations in the, in the uh, files, then you use features overrides to override those base features. And the idea is actually quite good. So it's kind of a user interface for, hook, for alter hooks. Um, before I found um, the overrides module, actually I would write the alter hooks myself. And then I found features overrides and it did that with a site building kind of way how we Drupalists love it. Um, so the idea is to have a base feature in your distribution. You can make changes and you can create an override feature um, to make those changes persistent. So even if you revert the base feature because it would be overridden or um, your changes would still be kept because your overridden feature ov overrides that. So your changes will not be lost. I asked my team, is it suitable to build a distribution? And now more people said, okay, no, it's not because there's no way of overriding feature overrides. That's also what Mike Parra says. He had a similar problem. They used Panoply, which was built on features to build open atrium, which was then using features overrides. And then there was no real way to customize Atrium because there's no such thing as an alter, alter hook. Um, so why do we think that uh, it doesn't work? In general, we like the idea and it sounds good, but we had many problems while uh, using it. It has performance impacts because we have the default hooks and then we have the alter hooks. Um, it makes the structure very complex. You, when, when you look at a view, you don't see where it comes from. It can come from a module, it can come from a feature, but then it also can come from a, or can be uh, um, customized by a, an override, override feature and you just don't see where this comes from. So it makes the structure of your project quite complex. Um, in simple use cases, it worked really nice and we really liked it, but um, then we had uh, Apple for service providers, which we built on, on, uh, with features, and we had to customize this, and it just didn't work out. We had fields in, in views, and features override said, yes, it's, it's all fine, it's exported, and you deploy it to your dev environment or your stage server, and it just, it just doesn't happen. So tasks as little as five minutes for adding a, a field to a view or changing the position of a field or something like this or changing a rule. It seemed so easy, five minute task, and then it took two hours to get it somehow in the feature. But since our deployment process is built on Git, I have to get it in a feature, I have to get it in code. And so I told my customer, well, yes, it's an easy task, it will only take two hours because I knew I will fight with features longer than I will fight with the task itself. So it proved as really good idea, but didn't work out. So then there's features 
tools. Um, it brings four main features, but I will focus on the unlink uh, feature, the feature unlink feature. <laughs> um, so it's, it's made to unlink parts from an existing feature. And this way you can deploy something with a feature and on your next server, for example, the stage server, you can unlink those parts and then override it. So um, for example, you deploy um, a panel with some demo content. On your live site, you unlink it and the customer can actually um, change the text in the panel and the feature will not be overridden. And if you revert the feature, it will not touch your panel anymore because you unlinked it. So this actually sounds very nice as well. And we, d we didn't only use it in, uh, in distributions, also in other sites that we built. Um, and it kind of works in a way that it writes the configuration from your feature back in the database and then ignores your feature. And then you can actually also you could probably create a new feature on top of that as well. So I asked my team, is that usable? And they were even more sure that it's not usable. And um, the reason is that it's, again, a good idea, but it's, again, a workaround for a problem that we have, and it has some deployment issues. It just also doesn't work, and you have to go to your live site and actually click on link. So this cannot be automated that way. Um, for non-experienced users, it's very complicated, and ev even our experienced users, when we gave them features unlink and said, yeah, just use it, they're like, wait, what do I do, and why do I do it this way? And yeah, it turned out to be quite complicated. Um, and somebody in our team said, well, we keep our overrides in a separate module, and I don't like this idea. I don't at all. If, if you deploy something that could be changeable, everything that you deploy can be changed on the live server, but you don't see in that section where you can edit or customize it. So if you have a field that you can or want to uh, customize, you don't see if it's unlinked or not. So there's no way of being sure that it's unlinked, which we didn't like either. Mm. But in some cases, it resolved uh, the overrides. So that's why some people said, yes, we could actually use it. But the main reason we didn't like it, not all components are exportable. They're not supported by uh, FTools Unlink. So we just couldn't use it. I think it was actually rules that were not unlinkable. And we work a lot with rules. So yeah, no way we could use that. Um, yeah, then there's the default config module. Um, the idea is that uh, we use features to export permissions and roles and to provide some kind of default settings for installation profiles. It actually aimed at installation profiles. And the idea is pretty good and it grew and now you can do much more than permissions and roles. You can pretty much use everything as a default config. And um, it serves as a set of default configuration, kind of the soft configurations that I talked about before. And you can always, um, it, it works in a way that it only adds the configuration once while the feature is enabled. And then when you revert the feature, it just doesn't touch it anymore because it's default and will not be changed. There are buttons to uh, revert them. But um, usually when you, when you deploy the, your feature with some changes and you revert the feature, your default config doesn't get touched anymore. Um, so there, the default config can easily be uh, overridden by admins that set up the live site, for example. Um, I asked the team and most of them actually said, yes, this sounds like a good idea. We should use this. And we actually used this in one uh, customer project where we didn't even build a distribution but we wanted to deploy some panels and some boxes with content where the customer said, you have to deliver the default version, the first version, and then I want to customize it. So we used it back then. Um, so why did our team think that uh, it's usable? Because the distribution should be usable right away. You install it and you can start using it. Um, 
yeah, the, the distribution should also still work when the user changes those sets of uh, soft configuration. And um, they can actually be restored. So there is a button restore default config. It's way out of focus from the feature. You have to dig down deep in the module's architecture to find that little button to reset it. And you have to do it when you develop the, um, the default config that you want to publish. And when you work with multiple team members on it, it can crash quite easily because people don't, you, you don't even see that it's overridden. There's no indication at all. And we actually had the problem that developers had to do task to, task to, um, tasks twice because one didn't completely revert the default config but changed something in the default config and featured it and the first uh, things were gone, um, which was quite annoying. So the development process with the default config was actually not that nice. So we came up with a module we call unlinked default configurations and it uh, this is a quote from Drupal.org. It provides possibility to move site configuration from files to database with just a couple of ticks. So the idea is we have our configuration in a feature or in a default hook in our module, and we usually can't feature it then. So um, we want to move that configuration back into the database so we can then export it again with features, for example. So yeah, as I said, you can uh, change your uh, configuration, you can change views, panels, content types, rules, everything that a distribution usually provides. And uh, you can move the configuration that comes with a distribution to the database and then actually customize it. Um, I don't know, has, has ever anyone tried to customize the card view that comes with a commerce module? Was it fun? No, the problem was you couldn't feature it, right? Yeah, okay, it wasn't fun. So um, this, this module actually works with any kind of configuration that comes in the default hook. It doesn't even have to be a feature. Um, so you can then change your configuration, your view, your rule, whatever, and export it again with features. The problem is when you have a default hook that brings a view, you can customize the view in your, in your development environment, and then you go to features, and th then and feature says, yeah, hey, there's a view, and you can export it, and you click export, and it doesn't do it. it. It just doesn't do it. Nothing happens in the feature itself, and this is the problem that we solve when we completely copy the whole view into the database, removing it from the, no, it's still in the code, but we ignore the code base then, we can then actually export it with a feature again, or with a bulk exporter. So our team, which actually developed this module, now likes the module because it actually solved our problem that we had with features and features overrides. I asked, why did why do you like it? Well, it's easy to use. It's just some clicking of uh, buttons. I want to unlink this view. I want to unlink this rule, and you click save, and everything is fine. Um, it's useful when you want to customize a distribution. As I said, the distribution delivers configuration in default hooks, and you want to change those, you can just unlink them from the features or from default hooks. Um, yeah, and it helped our team to make data exportable. So this actually solved our problem of refeaturing and re-exporting. And it doesn't matter if the configuration we want to change comes from a feature or comes from, from a module. And that's when we decided, okay, with this approach, we can now deploy all of our configuration in Apple Platform in default hooks, and we don't even need features because it doesn't matter if it's a feature or not. And then when somebody wants to customize Apple Platform, he can unlink the stuff that we provide that he wants to change and use features as in a regular deployment process to actually deploy his uh, customizations then. There's also some tools that we know about that we haven't used, for example, Profiler and Profiler Builder that help you with uh, building uh, the profiles and distributions, but we did it by hand. And then there's apps and feature set. 
I know they exist and I heard lots of good stuff about them, but we haven't used them. That's why I just mentioned them here, but I can't tell you any experience because we just don't have any experience. Um, yeah, then there's that thing with updating distributions. You can always use Drush up and it updates your core and it updates your um, contrib modules, but most of the times distributions also patch modules. They include patches in the make files for the modules, and when you just update the module, the patch gets lost and maybe the distribution completely breaks. And I've seen that happen lots of times and I see it in the issue queue that people complain to us, hey, your distribution sucks, I cannot update it. And usually, the, the biggest issue is that patches get lost on the way. Um, so the general approach is telling people, hey, you wait until we update the contrib modules and then you only update the distribution as a whole thing. Um, but we are not happy about it. The users that use the distribution are not happy about it. Actually, nobody is. Um, and then there's the module distribution update status manager, which actually forbids you to update your site. So when you go to your update report, it only tells you, hey, you are using Apple Platform, you are using OpenHM, or you are using Panoply, and it's up to date. It doesn't tell you all the contrib modules anymore because you shouldn't care about them because you don't want to break them. Of course, you can click a button, you'll say, I know what I do, I want to do it anyways. Then it lets you do that. But uh, in general, this is a nice approach of actually actively telling people, hey, yes, this contrib module is maybe out of date, but it's not even, <coughs> it's not even a security issue. So just leave it the way we provide it. I don't know who has heard about DropGuard. We have been very loud about DropGuard here. We actually have a um, possibility to update distributions, and we also have a possibility to detect patches in contrib modules. So when you want to still update your distribution, maybe you can have a look at that, because we actually compare the, the code on your server and the code from drupal.org, and we create a patch, and then we update the module, and we apply the patch, and you should be good to go. So if you really want to update your contrib modules right away and not wait for the distribution to be updated, maybe you can have a look at DropGuard. So in general, um, I also asked the team anything else you want to add to my presentation, anything you want to tell the people, and everybody said, well, developing a distribution is not an easy thing and it requires a lot of work and oftentimes you don't even see it that it requires so much work, so they just want you to know building a distribution is lots of work. Um, you should always know your target audience and the use cases exactly. To, and this applies on do you want to build a distribution or do you want to use a distribution? And if you use one, does it ex exactly do what uh, you try to do with it? Um, you should not add all the requested features. We get feature requests for Airpal in the issue queue on a weekly basis and lots of the features are like one use case again that only this person needs. So we tell them, hey, maybe you build it yourself. We don't want to focus on specific use cases with our distribution, we want to make it flexible. And so we don't add your feature request now, but of course we help you to actually implement your feature request. Sometimes it's a pain to keep all the contrib modules up to date. As I just said, it's quite hard um, to, wh when you have lots of patches in your distribution and you as a, a maintainer need to update those modules, of course you need to check why did I have this patch? Is this patch maybe included in the new version of the module that I just patched so I don't need it anymore? If it's not included, does it still apply? Do I need it? So this is stuff that you need to consider. Um, if, you, if you know Drupal, it's perfectly fine that you use a distribution because it's still Drupal. You can customize it with views, with fields. You can still do whatever you want, but we have also experienced people who install a distribution because they think it solves all their problems and they have never heard of Drupal before. And then they write us in the issue queue, hey, how can I change the background color of this, of this program? And I'm like, yeah, well, Maybe you use C CSS. Oh, how does that work? I'm like, yeah, have you heard about Drupal? No, what is that? So 
please don't forget your distribution is still Drupal, which is nice for us Drupal developers, but for somebody who's not a Drupal developer, yeah. And the learning curve still exists. So when you want to dig into a distribution, don't forget it's still Drupal, which is sometimes hard, and now we add features and functionality, so we actually add to that complexity, and there's often a learning curve for the distribution itself that adds on top of the Drupal, uh, Drupal learning curve. Sometimes it's not a good idea to start a distribution, uh, to start a project from a distribution, only because it adds lots of st stuff that you need, but sometimes you need to evaluate, do I then need to customize the distribution so much that I spend more time in rebuilding those features that I need? For example, if I use Panoply, but I don't need panels and panels everywhere, I only want the CK editor, maybe it's not worth using Panoply then, but it's worth uh, adding the CK editor myself. Everything will be better with Drupal 8, Everything, as somebody in our team said, to be honest, I looked uh, uh, at the features module for Drupal 8, which is only developed to build distributions, but I think it will still bring the same problems that we have faced that I just told you about. And uh, Mike, the maintainer of features and features overrides, he said there's, it's not start yet, but we will also provide features overrides. And I'm like, okay, then the problem that we have uh, have, have uh, had while developing the distribution, they w will not go away in Drupal 8 if we use the same approach. So I guess we will, with the CMI, I'm not sure if we still need something like the unlinked defaults module that we provided for Drupal 7, but I guess we will try to go more in the direction like this as well with Drupal 8. So what are the three things that I want you to take home? Um, First of all, have a look at existing distributions. It's fun to see how people did stuff. You can learn a lot, and maybe you can even speed up your development process, and maybe you can use one of them. Try building a distribution, and if you're strong enough like we are, try building a customizable one, and maybe don't use features. I know if Mike would have sit here, he could tell you that you could use features. Um, but this is our experience, so maybe we can start a discussion about that. Um, yeah, and maybe have a look at our unlinked default configurations module. Even if you don't use a distribution, if you only use the commerce module, which brings a view for the card and you want to customize it, use unlinked default configuration to unlink that view from the module, customize it as you want, and put it in your feature. Thank you very much. Uh, as a thank you, I brought some nice posters if you like. I have a couple here, and now I'm open to some questions. So many all at once. So the question is if we evaluate it to build everything from Drupal APIs. Um, yes, I'm, in, in Apple we use the Drupal APIs, so to deliver the views that we deliver, we use the default hook, and this is Drupal API, so yes. Or is that? Yeah, but that's exactly what we do. We, so we use the, the user interface to create that view, and then we click the export button and add it to our code in the default hook. And this is default, uh, this is uh, Drupal API. So yes, we, we only use Drupal API. When we don't use feature, and features also uses only uh, the, default, um, the default API. So yeah, we actually use the API. Okay, how do you handle uh, updating the base code and your client-specific code in the repository view? We have, I think, three or four different repositories, and then we use Git sub-modules and 
Zoom links and stuff like that? How do you handle updating client-specific stuff and client themes with your base code? Okay, so it depends a little bit on which features of the distribution we want to update. With the approach we have, when we provide a, um, a view, for example, in the default hook, and you use that distribution, you update the distribution and the code changes, you get all the updates. Once you unlink the view and put it in your feature, you will not get our updates anymore. Is that answering your question? Yeah, so you basically break the update path for all the base stuff. Kind of, yes. Okay. Everything that you customize is then in your hands. We have no uh, chance to do anything there anymore. But that, that was a discussion that we had before and we actually said this is the way we want to go because then it's still easier for you to customize it. So it, <laughs> yes, we, we, don't, uh, we don't have a chance to update your customization anymore. Any more questions? Okay, then uh, thank you. I just want to remind you for the Friday sprints, I guess you've heard often about it, but please attend the sprints and make Drupal 8 happen. And then I ask you to give some feedback. It was my first Drupal concession, so, uh, so I'm very excited uh, about your feedback. Please be honest, even if you didn't like it, tell me, then I will not annoy you next time. Thank you.